Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for the special webinar brought to you by the Open University Business School as part of Learning at Work Week. My name is Hilary Collins and I'm a lecturer in management at the Open University. I'm delighted to be hosting today's session and equally delighted to be joined by Terry O'Sullivan, who is the MOOC Program Director at the Business School at the Open University. Good afternoon, everybody. Over the next 45 minutes, we want to share with you some of our perspectives and thoughts on adding value through professional networking, and we hope you'll find this interesting and thought-provoking. The webinar we are hosting today forms part of a wider set of activity taking place during Learning at Work Week, which has been running throughout this week. This initiative, which we're proud to be involved in, is coordinated by the Campaign of Learning and is an annual opportunity to celebrate and promote the benefits of workplace learning. All sorts of organizations are running activities during this week, so thank you for taking the time to join us here on this forum. You'll be able to interact with us during this webinar in a number of ways. You'll see on your screen a chat panel and we'll invite you to share your questions there and we'll try and answer as many as we can. There's also some technical support. You'll see a red live event technical support button on your right hand side. So don't hesitate to press that if you're having some difficulties. And you'll have a chance to participate in our polls when we hand over to our technical manager, Andrew, to launch those. Just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded and available online after this session. So if you have any colleagues who would like to join in, you can share this with them. Now, we're actually going to move on to our first poll, which is... Poll one, what's your main motivation for networking? Is it A, to generate new leads for my business? Is it B, to keep in touch with existing customers? Or is it C, to gain information, for example, on what the competition is up to? Or is it D, to create opportunities for innovation? Or is it E, other? So, to repeat that, what's the main motivation for networking? A, to generate new leads for my business. B, to keep in touch with existing customers. Or C, to gain information, e.g. on what competition is up to. D, to create opportunities for innovation. Or E, other. If you'd just like to take a minute or two to put forward your ideas, that would be great. We're now going to move on and introduce our video, which is in, in a video with Terry, who's Terry O'Sullivan, who's interviewing Dr. Peter Bloom, a leading researcher from our Department for People and Organizations, who argues that networking should not be just about advancing your career, but can create important learning and innovation in organizations. So over to Terry for this film. Thank you very much, Hilary. Okay. Peter, could you discuss some of the myths surrounding networking? Uh, sure. I mean, I do think that there's a general perception, as uh, we all know, about what networking is. Networking is seen as kind of this style over substance, this idea that it's not what you do, it's who you know. And there's a notion that if you can just use your charm, if you can use your charisma, if you can use your connections, you can get ahead, whether you deserve it or not. And I don't think that's in a completely inaccurate notion of what some forms of networking are. <laughs> Especially, we do live in a society that has a lot of inequality, both you know, socially and economically. And this can be a way in which people use networking either to reinforce some of this inequality or as ways in which to sometimes advance themselves past it. But it's not the entire story of what I think modern networking is. And why I say that is that it's networking is something that can go beyond just making personal connections 
or reinforcing those personal connections or moving ahead through those personal connections. Networking can also be something in which we discover more about ourselves and the organizations in the context in which we work toward. Mm -hmm. So one of the myths that I would like to, if I can, uh, debunk, if we will, about networking is this idea that networking doesn't have a substantive role. It doesn't have an interesting role that can play in really improving organizations. Mm. So one of the key elements to think about this is the recognition that we live in a network society. We live in societies where organizations are not so easily discrete units. They're not these unified things that everyone is doing the same element and everyone works in the same building and everyone has the same social goal. I mean, now we have global corporations, for instance, that have a variety of networked parts. We can talk about this in terms of technology, right? We have digital networks mm -hmm. and we're connected through our digital networks, right? So we live in a more networked society. And networking can be a very strong way in which we can learn more about these networks, how these networks operate, and how they can be improved. And that's why I think improving our network skills and improving what network is meant for can actually not only help debunk some myths about networking, but actually improve how networking is done. Great. Well, thanks very much for that. That's a really interesting thought that networking is actually more important and, and is worthy of serious consideration. It's not just, <laughs> you know, kind of getting on through being glib. Yes. Can, you, can you tell us a, a bit more about how, what you see as the benefits then of networking for people and organizations? Absolutely. Um, I think if we can see one of the first benefits is really organizational innovation. And I say this because when you network, you're actually involving yourself in a process of learning. If you're just meeting someone and saying, hi, my name is, and then trying to give them your resume, that might not be a full process of learning. But if you use networking as a way in which you interact, and as a way in which to learn more about what's going on in other parts of your organization, you can actually bring that back as a form of, inno as a form of innovation within your own area, right? And in your own kind of function within the organization. So sometimes on a very informal level, that can mean you meet someone, you make a connection with them, and you say, how does your part of the organization do this? Or what do you do in your part of the institution? Or what challenges have you had? And learning from them from a place of openness, from a place of actually learning through networking how different parts of the network operate, you can improve and innovate within your own parts of the network. Great. You, you mentioned openness there. Yes. Tell me a bit more about that as well, a way perhaps to overcome some of the barriers that might stand in the way of effective networking. Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's how we also think about networking. Oftentimes, networking can be very instrumental. It's, how can I advance? But an openness in terms of networking comes from a point of view of saying, I'd like to learn something from this person. I'd like to learn the perspective. I'd like to go beyond maybe my own narrow confines and really see what they have to say and what they have to offer. And this is a movement that I think that we can use from networking to engagement. Right? And kind of bringing this back to issues of innovation, I think this process is kind of organizational discovery exactly around this openness because there's this horrible cliche and, and I do say that you know we have to think outside the box but I do if, if I could add to the noise of it of providing another cliche I think you don't just have to think outside the box you have to go outside the box right and in order to be able to truly innovate, you have to discover what other perspectives are. You have to discover how things are done in other places. And that's a key part of why you have to network. So when you go with an openness as opposed to an instrumentality, what you're really trying to do is learn. And learn not only what they're doing, but how you can do things differently as well. Going outside the box might be quite challenging. Can you give me some examples of, sure. let's say, how that might affect how networking happens? Absolutely. I, I think there is sometimes a common notion that networking occurs in these kind of informal, almost old boys club notions of, let's go have a beer. Or in increasingly these kinds of now almost uh, forced social arrangements of, we're going to have faculty teas, which are really great experiences and really excellent means of making connections. They can be. But networking doesn't have to stop there. That can be a first point of contact. And what we can do is create from these informal, if you will, meetings, sure. 
Um, maybe even some more formal process of collaboration. I think one of the best ways to do it is if you have a chance to, once meeting someone and having a discussion, to actually ask to take them out to lunch or ask them to engage in a process of more formal questioning. And this can be done even like away from face-to-face -face meetings. So once you meet someone, you can actually engage digitally. It's like, do you mind if I jot you some informal questions? I think you can also look at some kind of cross-disciplinary, if you will, or you know, cross-organizational, intra-organizational um, forms of networking. So networking doesn't just have to be shaking hands and again having beer. It can also be going to say, do you mind if I shadow just for an afternoon your section of the organization? Do you mind if I sit in on this meeting? Oh, I noticed that you're doing something very interesting here. Do you mind if I just kind of tag along? And this is a way in which you're more formalizing a process of openness and engagement. And networking then becomes from the personal to a little more the institutional. Oh, well, thanks for that really interesting uh, video there, Terry. Um, we've now got the results of the poll in. So from the question to generate new leads for my business, 26.9% of you voted for that one. To keep in touch with existing customers, 7.6% of you voted for that one. To gain information, for example, on what the competition is up to, 17.2%. To create opportunities for innovation, 33.1%. Other, 15.2%. So Terry, what, what do you think of those results? Um, it's an interesting one with creating opportunities for innovation, isn't it? Isn't it, Hillary? I think that's, that, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating uh, in the light of what Peter Bloom was saying about networking's important role uh, in organizational innovation and also uh, in organizational learning. Um, mm. Interesting that it's kind of neck and neck with generating new leads for my business, which is, I guess, what uh, the traditional r rationale for spending time network is, uh, networking is, or has been, let's say. And I'm, you know, I'm not denying that's a very, very important part too, because very often it's precisely through those new leads that you're going to um, create the opportunities for innovation um, that uh, that we've mentioned. But I think it, you know, it's it's really, really interesting that um, our uh, webinar contributors are seeing how. Um, uh, it's got both this, if you like, sort of self-interested, advancing my own agenda mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of function, but also uh, creating opportunities for other people as well through that. And I think that's really, really important uh, when you're approaching networking is to try and emphasize the reciprocal benefits that can be created. And this is the basis on which we are approaching it uh, in the MOOC that we'll be, um, we'll be uh, uh, sort of presenting on Future Learn uh, later on this summer as part, mm. of, uh, as part of a program of, of MOOCs on basic business or fundamental business skills. Um, interesting too that um, Peter points to the importance of developing and improving your networking skills in order to create those sorts of opportunities for innovation. Yeah, that's really true, Terry. And actually, we've got a comment here from uh, Christoph. I'm not sure where you're joining us from, Christoph. And he's actually said he he would differentiate between networking within and outside the organisation, and um, that's quite relevant to what we're discussing as well, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm really thank you so much, Christoph. I'm really really pleased that you've made that point because actually that plays to the agenda of this webinar, where we will be talking about um, intra organisation networking as well as inter-organizational networking. Um, later on we'll be, um, we'll be uh, 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 enjoying um, a, a video with our, uh, my colleague um, uh, uh, from, uh, um, sorry, excuse, <coughs> excuse me for a moment, <coughs> um, a, a video where the benefits of uh, organizational collaboration uh, and networking's role in that um, uh, are, are sort of underlined. That's from uh, Carol Jarv uh, J Jackson Jarvis, who mm. who, uh, who has done quite a lot of research in this area. So this is actually quite, um, you know, it's an important and original uh, area of research. And I think we're very, very lucky to have her input on this webinar. Yeah. Oh, one last point then, actually, which has just been made um, about reflective practice. Uh, it's really mm. asking if that's heading towards reflective, uh, reflective practice. 
That's a, again, that's a really interesting idea. There's some work by an American uh, academic called Raylin where he talks about reflection as needing other people, mm. but you can't really complete the cycle of reflection on your own. You need to try out the ideas that are coming to you uh, about you know, framing or reframing an experience or a piece of learning through looking at a sort of community aspect. So going out and actually sort of sharing these ideas with people through the act of networking and within networking uh, and, ne and the, the networks you create, I think is a very, very valid, valid point. So thank you very much for that reflection. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, mm. Now, unfortunately, it's come to the time, well, fortunately and unfortunately, because uh, unfortunately because it was so interesting, and fortunately we're on to the next um, point. So if I could ask WorkPass to, to launch poll two related to the uh, video for the next session, and uh, just while that's being done, uh, I'll just read those out to you. So poll two is what's your main obstacle to networking? Is it A, not enough time? Is it B, insufficient opportunities? Is it C, difficult to explain what I do to non-specialists? Is it D, I don't feel comfortable sharing personal information with strangers? Or is it E, other? So I'll repeat that. What's your main obstacle to networking? A, not enough time. B, insufficient opportunities. C, difficult to explain what I do to non-specialists. D, I don't feel comfortable with sharing personal information with strangers. And E, other. So I'd invite you to do the, the poll. And if I can actually move on then and introduce the next video. So in this video, Terry is talking to Karen Jacqueline Jarvis, who's a leading researcher from our Department of Public Leadership and Social Enterprise. Actually, I think... I think actually I'm, I'll be talking to Robbie McPherson um, in this, this next one coming up. Sorry to okay. uh, interrupt you. No, not at all. I'm just yeah. going. Um, and are you still talking about the groundbreaking research um, into organizational collaboration? Uh, well, collaboration comes into it, but mainly Rob, what Robbie is talking about is the role that networking, if, if indeed this is the video, this is the role that networking has played in his career. Um, and in particular, he shares some quite interesting tips about how to do it uh, effectively and how to get over some of the barriers that uh, we've been asking people about um, their, their, their views on in, the, in poll two. So I'm hoping that's going to feed interestingly into the results of poll two, so we can have a chat about that in the next segment. Okay, well, thanks very much for correcting me on that, Terry. Um, perhaps we can move on to the video on that at the moment. Robbie, can you start by telling us about your, uh, your own experience of networking and the various uh, guises that you've uh, occupied? Well, yes, I will. Um, I don't think I'm a, a natural networker. Uh, I think I am very interested in other people and finding out about them. Um, now and again, I have found it quite difficult to describe what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. And clearly, if you want, want to build a network, then people have to know what it is that you have to offer. Uh, so actually, uh, being able to explain that in a coherent way that the person you're speaking to understands, and I put emphasis on that because you need to be able to tailor what you're saying at least a bit to the sort of person that you're speaking to. Um, so no doubt we might talk about elevator pitches, and that's a good thing to have, but you might have several and that you can vary depending on the For sort of audience. People. Yeah, that's mm. right. Um, so I've, I've had several careers, uh, and in all of them, it was useful to be able to form relationships with colleagues and customers and senior people, um, stakeholders, whatever we want to call them. Uh, and my career has ranged from working in the civil service, initially in the home office, more specifically in the prison department. Um, so it was very important to understand what else was happening in other prison establishments and also to understand something about the way that prison management, prison service management were thinking. Mm -hmm. So to be able to talk to them about that, uh, 
clearly in that sort of um, bureaucratic organisation, people's development and promotion depends a bit on forming relationships with other people. And I think for lots of young people, young professionals, uh, it is a bit, uh, makes you a bit awestruck mm. to go into, particularly, you know, if you're, if you're a relatively shy, relatively introverted person and you're told by your boss, I want you to go to this business networking meeting or, uh, and there's 50 people there and there's a huge amount of noise, you know, who on earth are you going to speak to? And you don't want to get shoved in a corner with the other shy person who's there. So, Have you got any tips then on uh, how to overcome that, those sorts of barriers? Because I think that is, that's an anxiety a lot of people share about starting to network. Well, I think uh, I was saying this only to, to some volunteers only uh, last week. Uh, I th the, the key to being confident in a situation like that is to prepare. Uh, so, uh, think about what things you might want to ask another person, think about what things you might want to say uh, about yourself and actually practice saying them so that it, it, does, it doesn't come as a shock when you, you actually go and uh, approach somebody that you've never known and say, hello, I'm Robbie and what's your name and how are you today and know what you're going to say after that. Um, so, that bit of practice and for lots of people that will seem, so calculating is, so for lots of people we're supposed to have be good naturally yes. at, at spontaneous conversations yes. with other human beings, well we're not. <laughs> and the fact is that so many of us, for it's, it's a bit of a task. Yeah. So Perhaps the people who are good are the people who take the trouble, as you say, to prepare, which is quite kind in a sense to the other person. Because if you're, you know, it's helpful to be talked to in order to talk back. Yes, it? absolutely. Yeah. So. If you could get a hold of a list of attendees before you go to a meeting or a, a breakfast, a business breakfast or a conference and think about which of these people would be really interesting to meet. Uh, and we've got some fantastic internet tools. You can usually find lots of people and find out a bit about them and therefore be able to talk to them. Can you give us an example of uh, something you can point to where networking, again, between organisations has perhaps helped each organisation to do better? So, <coughs> I, I think, um, I, won't, I won't give you the specific details, okay. but I think, um, I think where relationships, there are good relationships between organisations, particularly where they're trying to partner and work on something jointly, we, we know that it, they're almost always going to run into some problems. There'll be some unpredicted things that would cause them difficulty. And it is then a test of the relationships. Because if, if the work isn't going quite as smoothly as we, sh we thought, the, the great danger if the relationships are not good is that I begin to distrust you. So you're trying to get one over on me, mm. as opposed to, well, when we first decided how we were going to do this work, we didn't actually spend quite long enough understanding what you were going to do and what I was going to do. We were very keen to come to an agreement, get on with the work. So we, we didn't really explore all the, the minutiae of what, how it might go. Where the, the relationships are good, and I can just, um, take for granted that you have good intent mm. or if I assume good intent then things will go much better okay. and I, so I can think of lots of examples where that has been really really helpful um, so uh, in, in, in the business world it's often very difficult for, to persuade people that they should spend some time forming a relationship with another person oh that's just you know all that soft stuff and there's no profit in that well actually there is because if you've formed a good relationship and you know the other person and they know you and you trust one another, then when things do get difficult and the results aren't as you promised or as I promised, we'll still work side by side to do it as opposed to get into conflict about you said you'd do this and you've not done it and that sort of thing. So the, the networking stage, if you like, allows you to make that investment in, in creating trust, yeah. which is going to lead to much more sustainable and, uh, and equitable results. I, I believe so. I, I, that's the way that I try to operate.
Well, thanks very much for that, Terry, with uh, Robbie. That was a really interesting discussion. Um, and now we've got the results of the polls, which have come in, which is quite interesting again. Um, so the first answer on what's your main obstacle to networking, not enough time, got 27.8% votes. The second obstacle to networking, insufficient opportunities, 20. 35.2% actually, so that's a really popular one. And then difficult to explain what to do with non, what you do with non-specialists, 4.3. Um, I don't feel comfortable sharing information with strangers, 19.1. And other was 13.6. So poll three, what's the most serious risk from networking within and between organizations? Is it A, swapping favours, which is at odds with formal processes? Is it B, may create an exclusive in-crowd? Or is it C, may lead to groupthink and suboptimal decisions? Is it D, lack of accountability as deals are done behind closed doors? Or is it E, other? So to repeat that, what's the most serious risk from networking within and between organizations? Swapping favors is at odds with formal processes. May link an exclusive in-crowd. May link to groupthink and suboptimal decisions. Lack of accountability as deals are done behind closed doors. And E, others. So perhaps I could ask you, to vote on that and at the same time perhaps we could introduce the next video and in this particular video Terry is actually talking to Carol Jacqueline Jarvis a leading researcher uh, from our Department of Public Health and Social Enterprise and Carol shares insights from her groundbreaking research into organizational collaboration underlying the role informal networks can play in getting things done as well as discussing the risks and advantages of this, Carol ends with some useful practice on an advice to networkers. Carol, you've actually done a PhD in uh, collaboration between organisations. That's right. So I was wondering, what, have you, what can you tell us about the role that networking plays in effective collaboration between organisations? So what was really interesting was the relationship between the formal collaboration and the processes of meetings and decision making and then the link to the informal and the relationships behind the scene, what happened backstage. So that became a real area of interest for me in terms of well, what goes on on the front stage in these formal meetings and what goes on behind the stage in the um, ongoing relationships between people and how do the two interact with each other. Because mm. I guess organisations are comprised of individuals, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's yeah. all about us organising together, isn't it, and relating okay. to one another. So can you give me an example of how, um, I don't know, a, 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 a relationship or a, a, that ca that's come about between two individuals in different organisations? or perhaps even in the same organisation, mm. has played out against the more pr uh, formal processes that you mentioned? Yeah, so um, I was just thinking of some meetings that I observed and um, the way in which, just in observing them, uh, there'd be a couple of months between the meetings. Mm. And so you'd see an issue raised at, at one meeting and perhaps that, that issue seemed to be really stuck and there didn't seem to be any way forwards. And then a couple of months later, going back and seeing that that issue has moved on, a long way and then going to interviewees and talking a little bit more about well what's happened in the meantime how did you shift this forwards how did you get something on the agenda that wasn't on the agenda or how did you influence the way in which that issue was addressed and what I found was that people would talk to me about well I, I knew somebody or there was somebody I'd worked with before or we work with with somebody on another project and so we went back and we used those relationships and we talked these issues through in a different kind of way. People often express that as I got on so well with her or <laughs> I know her really well or yeah. you know I, yeah. people know each other from other contexts mm. but actually I think um, when you stand back and look at that it, it, it is about 
they get on so well, but um, it, there's something more substantial going on in terms of the long-term relationship building and the way in which they can then bring that forward, change an issue, address an issue backstage, and then bring it back into the formal meeting, get things onto the agenda. Um, I, do think it's, uh, I do think it's a risky yeah. um, kind of way of moving mm -hmm. forwards as well, in that the risk is that you, you fix something backstage between two of you, because you get on really well together, yeah. But actually, that doesn't influence the formal decision-making processes and the way in which collaboration moves forward. And so that bringing back into the formal arena is extremely important as well, so that we don't just end up with collusion between two or three people. Yeah, I can see that could cause a problem, particularly in organisations that need to be accountable to, to, uh, to a set of stakeholders. You can't have little sort of circles of influence and power that aren't accountable in that mm. sense. Mm. Did you get the sense uh, when you did the research that um, people were just naturally like this or did you feel that, um, that they actually had to develop these skills consciously? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting question and I wasn't asking them that mm. but just from my own interaction with people I, I think that is really varied. Um, I, w I was working with people in the voluntary sector and the public sector and often they came from backgrounds where their people skills were extremely important. So my own background is a social worker and, and lots of the people I was looking at in my research, they have that kind of background, community work, social work, healthcare, and they, they do tend to have very good people skills. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's because it comes to naturally to them. Mm. I think often it is something they have to develop over time. Mm. These days, I think, um, for a number of reasons, inter-organisational collaboration is becoming more and more important in all sorts of sectors. Mm. So, would you, I mean, have you got any, if you like, top tips for people that be uh, participating in this webinar about how they can develop their, their networking skills to make their attempts at organisational collaboration more effective? I think it's worthwhile really investing time in relationship building. I think that's part of the issue that we tend to think it's something that isn't worthwhile, that it's, mm. it's an extra, it's not integral. But actually, collaboration, inter-organisational relationships, they're all about people. So I, th I think just spending time is, is really important and allowing yourself and allowing other people in an organisation to have time to commit to relationship building is really important. I think also reflecting on how you relate that to your accountability, as, as you raised earlier, is extremely important. Mm. You know, so just reflecting on how that doesn't become collusive, but actually links back into your accountability structures. So again, the relationship between formal and informal, for me, is really, really important. So now we're over to poll three. Um, we've got our results, discussions, and questions. So having a quick look at what we've got here, see what everybody is thinking of. Um, so to answer the question, what's the serious risk from networking within and between organizations? Um, swapping favors is at, our, at odds with formal processes, and that's got 17.9% of the votes may create an exclusive in-crowd, 22.4% of the votes, may lead to groupthink and suboptimal decisions, 17.9% of the votes, lack of accountability as deals are done behind closed doors, 25.5% of the votes, and other is 16.3% of the votes. So Terry, would you would you like to make some comment um, on those results for us? Well, we seem to have lost Terry. Um, so just to uh, discuss some of the comments that are here, or to, to give you some feedback um, on those comments until Terry manages to get back with us. Um, Jennifer has mentioned here that people buy from people hired on their conscious biases, so it's important to have clear objectives before engaging at network events, which is a very pertinent comment there, Jennifer. Thanks for that. Susan's also made a comment about a time being a consistent effort and being authentic, and that's her particular approach. 
And Bernard is talking about positivity, passion, and enthusiasm, which can be infectious. Um, a comment here from uh, Jennifer, people buy from people and hire from them. So we've got some quite interesting comments uh, uh, on that, uh, on, on the results and the poll. Um, so thanks very much for the, the uh, from you for um, partaking in this particular um, webinar today. It's, I think we have lost our main speaker. No, so... no, I'm, I'm back. I'm pleased to say. Oh, great. Hello, okay. I'm back. I'm terribly sorry about that. <laughs> line, the line has dropped twice. <laughs> I, mean, I would have been able to talk during the videos, but unfortunately, um, it's cut out during the bits when I'm supposed to come back on. So sorry about that, people. Okay. I was just going to say, I'm really, really interested by that uh, poll result where, again, um, kind of un in an uncanny reflection of what's being said on the video, this concern mm. about lack of accountability through informal kind of favours being done, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, uh, yeah. is, is a live issue. Mm. And, I mean, interesting enough, Carol's work was done uh, in private sector, uh, sorry, in public sector organisations. And as will have been uh, evident from um, Robbie McPherson's interview, his, his uh, experience is largely um, in the uh, either the third sector or the public sector. Uh, and I think they're both... Um, kind of keenly aware of the need to be accountable and transparent about how particularly public resources are being used. So you can see that as a bit of an issue for um, for networkers in the public sector. But of course, we even in the private sector, we're very, very keen on the idea of transparency now. Um, so I think people have always got to be a little bit on their guard against to what extent are they serving what could be seen as their own agendas and, and uh, to what extent they're serving the, the wider interest, which brings us back quite interestingly again to the point that Peter was making in the first interview about, you know, we start with networking as being about advancing my own career, my own uh, interest, but we, we kind of very soon we developed this idea where we can recognize networking as something that has a positive impact on on opportunities for society and wealth creation or opportunity creation in different spheres. So, and I yeah, think we've, um, actually, yeah, we've actually got quite a lot of people here today from different mm -hmm. countries, so there is that mm -hmm. intercultural aspect to that, isn't it? That uh, yeah. the norms for this and the expectations can be slightly different, and the worries as well can be slightly different depending mm -hmm. on what part mm -hmm. of the world we're based in and working in at any particular time. Okay, so um, I'll just check and see if we've got any more comments there for you, Terry, now that you've managed to join us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep them coming, please. Um, Sunil uh, has, has actually said that networking is like a magical roundabout where all need, we all need to buy in and stay on. Don't jump off, when the, round, off the roundabout when you're satisfied. <laughs> so that's quite a good analogy, isn't it? Uh, jumping off the roundabout, yeah, because yeah. you should stay on. Welcome, welcome more people into uh, into in, onto the roundabout, I should say. Yeah. Yes, right. that's that's very true. And uh, and Mark has made a point that uh, about small talk works. I remember some of the best networks event he's been to, and there hasn't been a push to put your point across. Someone else mm -hmm. has mentioned listening, and I believe this is crucial, particularly in the small talk. Yeah. I mean, that's really yeah, relevant, yeah. isn't it? Trying mm, to make sense mm. of the nuances um, and perhaps the underpinning thoughts that are in perhaps small talk and what might be classed as being unimportant in some ways, but can be of crucial or important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, and there are tips for that too. I was interested in um, uh, Robbie's excellent advice about doing your preparation um, and even rehearsing uh, some of the things you might say to people in a networking situation. Um, but certainly, on your way to a networking event, you know, take the time to, to to read the paper, see what um, see what the uh, you know the breaking news is. I had I, I was on the way to a networking event last week. Actually, I'm, I'm a bit a bit, uh, a bit mean. I didn't actually buy a paper. I just picked up somebody else's discarded business section of the Daily Telegraph. And actually, four of the of the of the people I met uh, in the event worked for companies. Uh, which were featured in stories uh, on the first two pages. 
Mm. So immediately I had something to talk to them about, even though you know, some of them were quite sort of trivial stories. Others of them were actually quite, quite important ones. And I think people are always very, very interested in what's happening in their own, um, in their own um, uh, sort of professional contexts. Yes, so, well, it makes um, it easier yeah. to set, set up a conversation, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, actually, an yeah. interesting uh, question here that's just come in from Guy. Um, does the panel have a view on virtual networking, sort of e.g. LinkedIn? Well, um, yeah, it's something we cover, actually. Again, going back to the massive online open course I was training at the beginning of the uh, the webinar, um, something we cover, uh, we, we devote a week, in fact, in the course to it. And the various people to whom I've spoken, the various sort of expert practitioners, say that they don't really see online networking as different, essentially, from face-to-face -face networking. Rather, it's like, it's like a sort of continuation on a continuum uh, mm -hmm. that um, we live in a world where our presence is very often kind of as much online as it is face-to-face, -face, in fact, even more so in some respects. And you can combine the two, for example, when um, if you've got a smartphone, for example, you can make your presence known to people uh, that might have a connection to you, uh, even within a building. And I was speaking to people who do this quite regularly and as a result, meet up and have opportunities to discuss things with people who otherwise they might not realize were in the vicinity. But certainly things like LinkedIn and Twitter, both very, very useful ways of spreading your presence, if you like, and also creating opportunities for people to get back to you and contact you uh, and share opportunities and insights with you. No, that's true. And actually, that brings us on um, because LinkedIn and some of the social media networking tools are actually discussed in the MOOC that we have coming out on communication and mm. also on the webinar that's um, on tomorrow's lunchtime agenda, which is looking at communication now and communication in the future, which um, discuss the impact of social networking. Um, so... That would be something for tomorrow's lunch, if any of you are interested. Um, so actually, it really just remains for me now to, to thank uh, the audience particularly for joining us and taking some time out of their busy schedule at lunchtime. And also to thank you, Terry, for um, doing you know talking, talking through all this <laughs> well, no, and, dropping, yes, and, and dropping off the virtual network at some particular point in time uh, and uh, i hope that you manage to join us tomorrow for our communication webinar uh, thanks very much and i've got a lot of thank yous coming in from the audience here so um thanks thank you thank you for your kind comments Brilliant. Yeah, it's been it's been great fun. Thank you very much, Hilary. All right. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.